Good afternoon. Welcome to this much anticipated event, a debate and discussion with Christopher Hitchens and Alistair McGrath on the topic, Poison or Cure? Religious Belief in the Modern World. My name is Tom Banshoff. I'm director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown, and the co-convener of this event, along with the Ethics and Public Policy Center. The Berkeley Center is part of a university-wide effort to make Georgetown a global leader in the interdisciplinary study of religion and in the promotion of interreligious understanding. This effort builds off our academic strengths, our location here in Washington, D.C., our international networks, and Georgetown's Catholic and Jesuit identity, an identity that embraces dialogue with other faith traditions and with the wider secular world. What brings us together today is, of course, religious secular debate or dialogue. From one perspective, a kind of intellectual combat. From another perspective, a shared quest for truth marked by a willingness on both sides to ask and to attempt to answer very big questions. And I can think of no question bigger than the one on your program today. I anticipate an engaging conversation, and I have a sneaking suspicion it will be entertaining as well. We have a lot to look forward to, and with that, I would like to turn it over to Michael Cromarty, Vice President of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, and the real driver behind tonight's event. Michael, thank you for bringing us together. I look forward, I know we all look forward, to a stimulating conversation. Thank you, Tom. I'd like to begin by saying thank you to President DeJoya of this wonderful university for allowing us to have this event in this beautiful setting in Gaston Hall. I'm also grateful to Tom and his staff for all their uh, help and work in making this event possible uh, and co host it with the Ethics and Public Policy Center. Now, on the back page of your program, you'll see the names of some individuals and some foundations who helped make this event possible. We, of course, are very grateful for their generous support. I'd like to say a few words uh, also about our format. Mr. Hitchens will go first for 15 or 20 minutes, and then be followed by Professor McGrath, who will then have the same amount of time. Then Mr. Hitchens will then have eight to 10 minutes for rebuttal, and then he'll be followed by Professor McGrath for eight or 10 minutes. The rebuttals will occur, their, their presentations will occur from here, the rebuttals will occur from the seats. That way I can moderate. <laughs> we'll then open it up to questions from the audience, and the way we're going to do that is the following. I believe all of you have been given, I hope, three by five cards to write your questions on. They'll be collected by the ushers, and then I will read the questions. Now, there are almost 800 people here. I don't think we'll get to all 800, but we will get to, I hope, uh, uh, a significant amount of them. Now, I would, uh, I would not take time just now to give an extensive introduction of our speakers because you have in your brochure elaborate biographies of each of these gentlemen. And of course, I know you're here because you know their reputations and that's why you've come. So I would like to begin my introduction uh, with Christopher Hitchens this way, by calling your attention to this cartoon. In an issue this past June, the New Yorker magazine ran the following cartoon. I'll describe it to you. A woman, the wife is sitting on the couch, reading, and her husband is walking in the door, and just as he's coming in the front door, a bolt of lightning is striking him right in the back. And the wife says, I begged you not to buy that book by Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, he bought the book, and so have many others. Christopher's book, God is Not Great, has been on the New York Times bestseller list now for, I think, over 20 weeks. In introducing Christopher Hitchens, I should at least mention what some others have said about him and his gifts. Here's the London Observer who has said, he is one of the most prolific as well as brilliant journalists of our time. Or the Los Angeles Times has said this, he is a political and literary journalist extraordinaire. And the New York Magazine, the New Yorker Magazine has said, 
he is an intellectual willing to show his teeth in the cause of righteousness. And finally, Christopher, you would be interested to know that our mutual friend, the political philosopher Peter Berkowitz, who's here tonight, recently said this about you. Whether you agree or disagree with what he says or writes, Christopher is utterly incapable of ever being boring. Christopher, thank you for coming. We trust you will not be boring. Well, thank you, Georgetown. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming. Thank you, Michael, for that suspiciously terse introduction, <laughs> which of all the introductions I've heard to myself is certainly the most um, recent. <clears throat> thank you seriously to the Ethics and Public Policy Center for your work for, for con conceiving this idea, for encouraging me to do it, for bringing us Dr. McGrath all the way from our common alma mater of Oxford, and for the regular seminars that you may not know that Michael does all the time on these matters of faith versus reason, which is, after all, the ground on which we're met um, this evening. I always uh, come before events like this with antagonists like Dr. McGrath with a slight sense, a very slight sense, hope it doesn't sound self-pitying, of um, inequality. My views are, if I say it for myself, tolerably well advertised. And if they're not, it's partly your fault. Um, because what I say is fairly intelligible, very plainly stated. If I, you know what I think, if you care to find out. When I debate with Jews and Muslims and Christians, I very often find, I say, well, do you really believe there was a virgin birth? Do you really believe in a Genesis creation? Do you really believe in bodily res resurrection? And I get a sort of Monty Python reply. Well, this is a little bit of metaphorical, really. Um, I'm not sure, and I'm going to find out, I'm determined to find out this evening, uh, which line on this my antagonist does take. And I want you to notice, and I want you to test him on it. Because I think it's fair. Um, and I'm going to talk to him and to you as if he did represent the Christian faith. I can't do all three monotheisms tonight. I may get a whack at the other two in the course of the discussion. I can only really do his. And I'm, go I'm going to assume that it means something to him and that it's not just a humanist metaphysics. And I think I'm entitled to that assumption. Um, the, the main thing I want to dispute this evening, because I'm either drowning in time with 20 minutes, it's either too much or too little, is this. You hear it very often said by people of a vague faith that, well, it may not be the case that religion is metaphysically true. Its figures and its stories may be legendary or, or, or dwell on the edge of myth, pre, prehistoric. Um, its truth claims may be laughable. We have better claims, excuse me, better explanations for the origins both of our cosmos and our species now, so much better so, in fact, that had they been available to begin with, religion would never have taken root. No one would now go back to the stage when uh, we didn't have any real philosophy. We only had mythology. When we thought we lived on a flat planet, or when we thought that our planet was circulated by the sun instead of the other way around. When we didn't know there were microorganisms as part of creation and that they were more powerful than us and had dominion over us rather than we then. When we were fearful, the infancy of our species. We, we, we wouldn't have taken up theism if we'd known now what we did then. But Allow for all that, allow for all that. You still have to credit religion with being the source of ethics and morals. Where would we get these from if it weren't for faith? I think if in the time I've got, I think that's the position I most want to undermine. I don't believe that it's true that religion is moral or ethical. I certainly don't believe, of course, that any of its explanations about the origin of our species or the cosmos or its ultimate destiny are true either. In fact, I think most of these have been conclusively, utterly, discredited, but I'll deal with the remaining claim. Is it moral, again I can only do Christianity this evening, is it moral to believe that your sins, yours and mine, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, can be forgiven by the punishment of another person? Is it ethical to believe that? I would submit that the doctrine of 
vicarious redemption by human sacrifice is utterly immoral. I might, if I wished, if I knew any of you, you were my friends, or even if I didn't know you, but I just loved the idea of you. Compulsory love is another sickly element of Christianity, by the way. But suppose, I could say, look, you're in debt. I've just made a lot of money out of a God-bashing book. I'll pay your debts for you. Maybe you'll pay me back someday, but for now I can get you out of trouble. I could say, if I really loved someone who'd been sentenced to prison, if I could find a way of saying I'd serve your sentence, I'd try and do it. I could do what Sidney Carton does in A Tale of Two Cities. If you like, I'm very unlikely to do this unless you've been incredibly sweet to me. I'll take your place on the scaffold, but I can't take away your responsibilities. I can't forgive what you did. I can't say you didn't do it. I can't make you washed clean. The name for that in primitive Middle Eastern society was, was scapegoating. You pile the sins of the tribe on a goat, you drive that goat into the desert to die of thirst and hunger, and you think you've taken away the sins of the tribe. A positively immoral doctrine that abolishes the concept of personal responsibility on which all ethics and all morality must depend. It has a further implication. I'm told that I have to have a share in this human sacrifice, even though it took place long before I was born. I had no say in it happening. I wasn't consulted about it. Had I been present, I would have been bound to do my best to stop the public torture and execution of an eccentric preacher. I would do the same even now. No, no, I'm implicated in it. I myself drove in the nails. I was present at Calvary. It confirms the original filthy sin in which I was conceived and born the sin of Adam and Genesis. Again, this may sound a mad belief, but it is the Christian belief. Well, it's uh, here that we find something very sinister about monotheism and about religious practice in general. It is incipiently at least, and I think often explicitly, totalitarian. I have no say in this. I am born under a celestial dictatorship which I could not have had any hand in choosing. I don't put myself under its government. I am told that it can watch me while I sleep. I am told that it can convict me of, here's the definition of totalitarianism, thought crime, of what I think. I may be convicted and condemned. And that if I commit a right action, it's only to evade this punishment. And if I commit a wrong action, I'm going to be uh, caught up not just with punishment in life for what I've done, which often follows axiomatically, but no. But even after that, I'm dead. In the Old Testament, gruesome as it is, recommending as it is, of genocide, racism, tribalism, slavery, general mutilation, with the displacement and destruction of others. Um, I further think that it undermines us in our most essential integrity. It dissolves our obligation to live and witness in truth. Which of us would say that we would believe something because it might cheer us up or tell our children that something was true because it might dry their eyes? Which of us indulges in wishful thinking who really cares about the, the pursuit of truth at all costs and at all hazards. Can it not be said, do you not in fact hear it said repeatedly about religion and by the religious themselves that, well, it may not be really true, the stories may be fairy tales, uh, the history may be dubious, but it provides consolation. Can anyone hear themselves say, saying this or have it said of them without some kind of embarrassment? without the concession that thinking here is directly wishful, that yes, it would be nice if you could throw your sins and your responsibilities on someone else and have them dissolved, but it's not true, and it's not morally sound. And that's the second ground of my indictment. Michael, you will tell me when I'm trespassing on the time of uh, Dr. McGrath, won't you? 
Um, on our integrity, our basic integrity, in knowing right from wrong and being able to choose a right action over a wrong one, I think one must repudiate the claim that one doesn't have this moral discrimination innately, that no, it must come only from the agency of a celestial dictatorship, which one must love and simultaneously fear. What is it like? I've never tried it. I've never been a cleric. What is it like to lie to children for a living and tell them that they have an authority that they must love, compulsory love, what a grotesque idea, and be terrified of at the same time. What's that like, I want to know? And that we don't have an innate sense of right and wrong. The children don't have an innate sense of fairness and decency, which of course they do. What is it like, I can personalize it to this extent. My mother's uh, Jewish ancestors are told that until they got to Sinai, they'd been dragging themselves around the desert under the impression that adultery, murder, theft, and perjury were all fine. They get to Mount Sinai only to be told it's not kosher after all. I, I'm sorry. Excuse me. We must have more self-respect than that for, us, for ourselves and for others. Of course, the story is a fiction. It's a fabrication exposed conclusively by Israeli archaeology. Never, nothing of the sort ever took place, but suppose we take the metaphor. It's an insult. It's an insult to us. It's an insult to our deepest integrity. No, if we'd believed that perjury, murder, and theft were all right, we wouldn't have got as far as the foot of Mount Sinai or anywhere else. Um, now we're told what we have to believe. And this is uh, coming now to the question of whether or not science, reason, and religion are compatible or, I would rather say, reconcilable. The great Stephen Jay Gould, the late great Stephen Jay Gould, said that he believed they were non-overlapping magisteria. You can be both a believer and a person of faith. Sitting in front of me is a very distinguished, extremely distinguished scholar, Francis Collins, helped us to unlock the Human Genome Project, who is himself a believer. I, I'd love to hear from him. I hope we will hear from him. I don't believe he says that his discoveries in the genome convinced him of the truth of religion. He, he holds it, as it were, independently. I hope I do you no wrong, sir, in phrasing it like that. Here's why I, a non-scientist, um, a non-scientist uh, will say that I think it's radically irreconcilable, I'd rather say than incompatible. <clears throat> I've taken the best advice I can on how long Homo sapiens has been on the planet. Carl Sagan, Richard Dawkins, many others, and many discrepant views in theirs, reckon it's not more than 250,000 years, quarter of a million years. It's not less either. I think it's r roughly accepted. I think so you wouldn't dis disagree. 100,000 is the lowest I've heard. And actually, I was about to say, again, not to sound too Jewish, I'll take 100,000. Um, <laughs> I only need 100,000. Call it 100. For 100,000 years, Homo sapiens was born, usually, well, not usually, but very often, dying in the process or killing its mother in the process. Life expectancy, probably not much more than 20, 25 years. Dying probably of the teeth uh, after that, very agonizingly, near to the brain as they are. Um, or of hunger, or of microorganisms that they didn't know existed. Or of uh, events such as volcanic or tsunami uh, or earthquake uh, types that would have been wholly terrifying and mysterious. As well as some turf wars over women, land, property, food, other matters. You can fill in, imagine it for yourself what the first a few tens of thousands of years were like. Um, and we like to think, learning a little bit in the process, and certainly having gods all the way, worshipping bears fairly early on, I can sort of see why. Um, sometimes worshiping, worshiping other human beings, big mistake, I'm coming back to that if I have time. Uh, this and that and the other thing. Um, but exponentially perhaps improving, though in some areas of the world very nearly completely dying out and a, a bitter struggle all along. Call it 100,000 years. According to the Christian faith, heaven watches this with folded arms <clears throat> for 98,000 years and then decides it's time to intervene. And the best way of doing that would be a human sacrifice in primitive Palestine where the news would take so long to spread that it still hasn't penetrated very large parts of the world. And that would be our redemption of the human species. Now, I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen,
that that is what I've just said, which you must believe to believe the Christian revelation, is not possible to believe, as well as not decent to believe. Why is it not possible? Because a virgin birth is more likely than that. A resurrection is more likely than that. And because if it was true, it would have two further implications. It would have to mean that the designer of this plan was unbelievably lazy and inept, or unbelievably callous, and cruel, and indifferent, and capricious. And that is the case with every argument for design, and every argument for revelation and intervention that has ever been made. But it's now conclusively so, because of the superior knowledge that we've won for ourselves by an endless struggle to assert our reason, our science, our humanity, our extension of knowledge against the priests, against the rabbis, against the mullahs who've always wanted us to consider ourselves as made from dust or from a clot of blood, according to the Quran, or as the Jews are supposed to pray every morning, at least not female or Gentile. And here's my final point, because I think it's coming to it. <clears throat> the final insult that religion delivers to us, the final poison it jets into our system. It appeals both to our meanness, our self-centeredness, and our solipsism, and to our masochism. In other words, it's sadomasochistic. I'll put it like this. You're a clot of blood, you're a piece of mud, you're lucky to be alive, God fashioned you for his convenience even though you're born in filth and sin. And even though every religion there's ever been is distinguished principally by the idea that we should be disgusted by our own sexuality. Name me a religion that does not play upon that fact. So you're lucky to be here, originally sinful and covered in shame and filth as you are. You're a wretched creature. But take heart. The universe is designed with you in mind. And heaven has a plan for you. Ladies and gentlemen, I close by saying, I can't believe there is a thinking person here who does not realize that our species would begin to grow to something like its full height if it left this childishness behind, if it emancipated itself from this sinister, childish nonsense. And I now commit you to the good Dr. McGrath. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Christopher. Well, besides what you can read in his bio in your program, uh, I should let you know that Professor McGrath holds Oxford, two Oxford uh, doctorates, one a Doctor of Divinity for his work on historical theology and systematic theology, and another Doctorate of Philosophy for his work on molecular biophysics. Here's what Publishers Weekly said recently about his work. Dr. McGrath has distinguished himself as a historical theologian and as a generous and witty writer who brings to life topics that would turn to dust in others' hands. We're especially grateful that Professor McGrath has traveled all the way from Oxford last night to join us for this evening. Thank you, Dr. McGrath. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be here at Georgetown this afternoon. Now, someone had told me when I was growing up that I'd be here at such a distinguished place as Georgetown talking about atheism, I'd have been extremely surprised. I, th I think for two reasons. One was I grew up in Northern Ireland. Now, some of you may come from this place, but it's a, it's a kind of rather backward place. And uh, the greatest annual event of my youth was the Donica D. Donkey Derby. So you can see, you know, coming to somewhere like Washington is just amazing. So, you know, it's great to be here. But I think what would surprise me more would have been if someone to say, well, you're taking part in a debate about atheism, is I would have assumed that I would have been on the atheist side. Because certainly, as a young man, that was what I believed. I grew up in Northern Ireland, studying the sciences, wanting to go to Oxford to take this further. And it was very, very clear to me that the sciences disproved God. They completely eroded the ground on which faith stood. And, of course, there was violence between Protestant and Catholic in Northern Ireland. Therefore, my logic was infallible. No Catholics, no Protestants, no violence between Catholics and Protestants. So it seemed to me to be very, very straightforward. And certainly, uh, when I went up to Oxford to begin to study the sciences in much more detail, it seemed to me, really, I had sorted things out and could relax for a while. 
But I found myself being challenged by a number of things. One was being challenged by beginning to read the history and philosophy of science and reading that the kind of scientific positivism I'd imbibed wasn't quite as straightforward as I'd suggested. And also beginning to realize, actually, that the evidential basis for atheism was much weaker than I had realized. And I began to find myself being excited intellectually and stimulated far more than I dared to think by the Christian faith. And so in the end, I came to faith, swapping my old faith of atheism for my new one of Christianity. I don't think I did so as any kind of wish fulfillment or of any kind of psychological need. It was much more just a profound intellectual conviction that this was right, that this made sense in itself, and that this made sense of things as well. It was like someone, I suppose, who, had, who knew water discovering champagne. So for me, this was really a, a very significant uh, event. And indeed, to this day, I still look back at my atheist days with great nostalgia, even though uh, I no longer actually hold to those positions. And so it's a very great pleasure to be able to interact this afternoon with Christopher Hitchens. And I want to, to make it very, very clear that what he is saying today needs to be respected, and I hope I will behave respectfully towards him. I want to offer some points of disagreement, some points of challenge, some points of agreement, and also some genuine points of curiosity to try and get our conversation underway. And so I want to really focus on his main argument, which I think you've heard very, very clearly, that religion is immoral and leads to immorality, that in some way it is toxic. And these seem to me to be very significant arguments, very significant claims, and therefore I want to try and engage with them I apologize to him, and indeed, I also apologize to you in that in the time available, I will not be able to interact with him properly, but at least I hope I can begin to, to get this conversation moving forward. So an obvious question I find myself asking as I both read uh, Mr. Hitchens book and also listened to him speak, is that I think there are, there are aspects of this that I would love to have heard more about. For example, in recent years, especially the last 15 years, there's been a very substantial body of scientific research into the empirical effect that religious commitment actually has on people. And as someone who was a scientist and still remains wedded to evidence-based thinking, I wondered if this might actually come into Mr. Hitchens' presentation. To give you an example, if we look at uh, Koenig and Cohen's very famous book published in 2001, The Link Between Religion and Health, we find that the, the overwhelming body of empirical studies to look at this find a positive correlation between religious commitment and well-being. Now that does not prove that there is a God, and certainly it does not prove that all forms of religion are good for you. Uh, I will gladly concede, because I think Mr. Hitchens is right on this, that there are some forms of religion that are pathological, that damage people. But there's a need, I think, for a real discussion about what is pathological and what is normal, about what is the center and what are the fringes. And that, I think, also extends to uh, Mr. Hitchens' analysis of the impact of religion in general. He makes the point, and I think I want to say he is right to make this point, that religion has done much damage in history. I regard that point as being beyond contradiction, and it seems to me that every one of us here this afternoon needs to say that is right. But I think we need also to go further and begin to explore. And the kind of questions I would like to open up for discussion would include these. Yes, religion has done damage. But is this typical or is this a fringe element? Who are the normal people? Who are the fanatics? And it seems to me there's a real need to try and make this kind of adjudication. I grant the history is there, that there have been some awful things done. But as Michael Shermer, who's president of the Skeptic Society, wrote in a book, uh, How We Believe, some years ago, for every one of these atrocities, which must cause all of us deep concern, there are 10,000 unreported acts of kindness, generosity, and so forth, arising from religious commitment. And trying to get this balance right seems to me to have enormous importance. What is the fringe? What is the center? 
So that's one point I think I'd like to open up for further discussion. But I'd also like to try and just make a more general point, and that is that I think worldviews in general, whether they are religious, irreligious, whatever they are, have the capacity to animate people to the extent that they feel they must go and do things which many of us would regard as morally reprehensible. We see this in the Soviet Union, a rather grim period in modern history. We find, for example, Lenin having said basically that there is no higher authority by which he may be judged, feeling able to, I quote, uh, authorize the protracted use of brutality against religious believers. And it seems to me that we have here an ideology, a worldview, which basically is sanctioning violence, in this case, anti-religious violence. Now, I would not argue from that that this shows that atheism in general, or atheists in particular, are violent people. It's much more about what movements do to people, about the damage that worldviews can cause when they begin to take over and begin to really animate people to want to do things. Again, look at uh, the period under Stalin. There are many other examples we could give of worldviews that may well have begun with great excitement, great enthusiasm, a commitment to ideals that we can all identify with, but something happens and they go wrong. The French Revolution, I believe, began with an outburst of energy for liberty. But by 1793, it degenerated into the reign of terror in which an appeal to liberty sanctioned the most dreadful acts of violence. And many of you will know the tragic story of Madame Roland, who was brought to the guillotine on trumped-up charges in 1793. And as she was led to the guillotine, she pointed to a statue of liberty in the Place de la Révolution and said, Liberty, what crimes are committed in your name? History, I think, discloses a complex judgment here. I do not believe that it simply points to religion as being the cause of evil. I think it points to the capacity of all worldviews to begin to do this. It's not so much religion or indeed anti-religion. It seems to be something actually about human nature itself, which means that acts of kindness can be accompanied by acts of violence. There's something about us, I think, that really needs to be addressed there. So I don't think it's as straightforward as this. Religion poisons everything? I'm not sure. It can do, but so can other things as well. The real problem, I think, is extremism, the kinds of ideologies that force violence upon us, and those, it seems to me, do need to be challenged. And on that, I am at one with Mr. Hitchens. But is it God that's doing this? Let's move on and talk about this. Clearly, a very important question here is how we know what God is like. Can you imagine God saying, go and do violence to someone? Well, I think some could quite easily. But I speak from a specific perspective, namely that of a Christian theologian. And for Christianity, the identity, the nature of God is disclosed in Jesus of Nazareth. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And when we look at Jesus of Nazareth, we see something I think that is very, very challenging. We have one who refuses to do violence. Even in Gethsemane, when some want to raise swords to defend him as he's about to be betrayed, he bids them put their swords down. Jesus does not do violence, but he has violence done to him. And the point I want to make is that your vision of what God is like has a profound impact on what you think God is urging you to do. And it seems to me that if one is a good Christian, then one is going to take the vision of what God is like and what God wants us to do that we find disclosed in Jesus with the utmost seriousness. Now, let me make it absolutely clear, I concede, and I may well be one of these, that there are many bad Christians around who fail to live up to this vision. 
Do I want to draw a clear distinction between some Christians are bad and Christianity is bad? There is an aspiration, an inspiration, a norm. And that means one can challenge those who want in some way to use violence in the name of God. And of course, you can see this impacting on the way in which people behave in an episode that happened a year ago here in the United States. You've had, unfortunately, in recent days, some shooting incidents. And of course, what I'm talking about is the Amish schoolhouse killings of October 2006. And many of you will know of these. Some of you may have been affected by them. Uh, a crazed gunman broke into an Amish schoolhouse and shot, I think it was, 10 Amish schoolgirls, of whom five died. The Amish, as I'm sure you all know, are a very conservative Protestant sect who wear 17th century clothing, who won't drive cars, they use horse buggies, and they also regard the ethical example of Jesus as absolutely normative. For them, there will be no retribution of any kind. The cycle of violence was broken instantly because for them, Christ ordered them, commanded them to show forgiveness. That's a very important point. Religion, or at least in this case Christianity, contains within itself the capacity for self-criticism. This is not the way God is. This is not the way we should be behaving. And I fully concede there are those who fail to live up to that. But there is a challenge that can be issued to them. Why behave like this when there is the norm before you authorized as what God would like us to do? So it seems to me there is a very important point to make there. Now, Mr. Hitchens made some very interesting points about the relationship of science and faith. And of course, for me, who was studying science at Oxford, uh, doing research on molecular biophysics, these were live questions. And I certainly welcome his challenge to discuss these things further. But for me, there has never been this opposition between science and faith. Certainly, some say there is, but I would want to make this point, uh, building on what Stephen Jay Gould says. Uh, Gould, in his book, Rocks of Ages, makes the point, I think fairly, that although in his case he's an atheist, he was not an atheist on account of his science. That in many ways his atheism was already there, he brought it to his science. And he makes this point, that science by its legitimate methods, cannot adjudicate the God question. Certainly, we can read nature in an atheist way, we can read nature in an agnostic way, we can read nature in a Christian way, but nature in itself and of itself does not force us to any of those positions. And I will simply say that I find my Christian faith gave me new intellectual energy both to engage the natural order, to engage nature is to learn more about God, and also to energize my understanding of what I was observing. And I find this summed up in a quote from C.S. Lewis, which I am in the habit of quoting, I'm afraid. I believe, he writes, in Christianity, as I believe the sun has risen, not simply because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. In other words, it gives you an intellectual lens or framework through which you can look at the world, ourselves, culture, and see it in a new light. So for me, science and religion, there may be tensions, but there's also a very powerful synergy, which I believe to be both welcome and also something that can be developed further. But let me move on, if I may, and make a further point. Uh, Mr. Hitchens makes some very significant criticisms of religion, which I, need, I emphasize need to be taken seriously. But what I wonder does he offer in its place? In his uh, book, he talks a bit, especially at the beginning and the end, of the need for a new enlightenment. And I find this puzzling, though nevertheless extremely interesting. I find it puzzling because for me, as an intellectual historian, the Enlightenment really had been left behind us as being, in the view of many postmodern critics, 
a worldview that led to intolerance and a worldview that actually generated the potential for conflict and violence. You all know why postmodernity moved away from modernity on that point. And also, again, a point I would love to discuss further with Mr. Hitchens. People like Alistair McIntyre, other critics of modernity, make the point that its foundational judgments about the nature of reason, the nature of what is right, actually cannot be sustained on the basis of an appeal to history and reason itself. For McIntyre and for many others, the Enlightenment offers us a vision of a rationality and morality which actually are unattainable in practice. Now again, we might want to have a discussion about morality, and I fully accept that uh, Mr. Hitchens is very committed to the moral vision, has a real sense of what is right and what is wrong, but I wonder if one can sustain that without some sort of metaphysical basis. And the point I would want to raise is this. Is an evolutionary account of morality actually adequate to do the job? Richard Dawkins, with whom I disagree on many things in his selfish gene, makes the point that we alone have the capacity to react against our genes, to offer something better than we are genetically landed with. And it seems to me that is a very significant position. Or again, I discover that both uh, Mr. Hitchens and I are lapsed Marxists. To take Antonio Gramsci's point, Gramsci made the point that in culture, moral values are manipulated by interest groups. How on earth can we defend ourselves against this? My real question, Mr. Hitchens, is can one have a viable moral system without some sort of transcendent basis of morality? I make this point not to challenge him as a moral thinker, but simply to ask whether one can actually do this. So I must end, and I do so if I may, by uh, telling you a story based on my own Northern Ireland. The story is told of um, two Catholic nuns who were driving along one night when they ran out of gas. They realized they'd passed a gas station about 100 yards back, so they decided to walk back and fill up with gas. They rummaged about in the back of the car and they found a glass container which would do the job. Unfortunately, it was a medical specimen jar with the word urine written all over it. But it was all they had. They went back, filled up, and went to the car and started to pour this into the gas tank. A Protestant farmer drove by on his tractor, and he looked at them in utter astonishment. And he said, ladies, I don't think much of your religion, but I certainly admire your faith. <laughs> and, uh, as I hear Mr. Hitchens speak, and as I enjoyed his writing, I find myself wondering if he too is a man of faith, a man who believes that even though we can't absolutely justify certain beliefs, nevertheless we can trust them. He says, our beliefs are not beliefs, but I think they are. And the real question for me is in a world where reason and science do not deliver what we once thought they did, on what can we base our lives if we are to know that we are truly living the good, the beautiful, and the true life. Thank you very much. Mr. Hitchens will take the podium again. Michael wanted to do this, uh, do this sitting down, but I, it's the old demagogue in me. Um, I need the pulpit, I need the podium, and if I can't be erect, at least I can be upright. Um, by the way, do you know why the, why the Amish girl, the Amish girl, the Amish girl was excommunicated? Two Mennonite. Um, Look, I'm going to take the doctor's excellent points in order, if I may, and you're, you will, I'm sure, have minds orderly enough to recall the, the order in which he made them. On the empirical evidence, so-called, adduced, that a religious faith can lead to uh, greater health and well-being, I, in a sense, do not doubt it. I, in other words, I can easily imagine that those who think they are the special object of a divine design feel better for thinking so. I just think it's going to be very important for anyone claiming this to see the 
dismaying trap door that is right under their feet. If you're going to claim this for one, how are you not going to claim it for all? Do we not hear incessantly that the Hamas organization in Gaza is a provider of welfare to the poorest of the poor? Have we not heard this? Do we not hear that Louis Farrakhan's crackpot racist organization, the Nation of Islam, gets young people off drugs? For all I know, it's true. It not only says nothing about the truth or validity of their theology, but it must say a certain amount, at least, about our willingness to think wishfully or cultishly, which was, if you like, part of my point to begin with. Um, as to the center versus the fringe, I get this all the time. Don't judge religion by its fundamentalists and its extremists. No, why should I? I don't have to. I judge it by its foundational texts, and I judge it by the statements of its authorities. Uh, take a case from the Quran, just for once. Does it, actually it's not the Quran, excuse me. Take a case from the Muslim foundational documents, the Hadith, which have equal canonical authority. They say, if someone becomes an apostate, leaves or changes their religion, they must be killed. The sentence is death. Don't anyone be telling me that's a metaphor? No, oh, it's just intended as a sort of general admonition. No, it means what it says. And it's been applied to a couple of people who now have to live, friends of mine as a matter of fact, as political refugees in Washington DC who know how true the impact of that hadith. There's no wiggle room there, so the question for a Muslim must be asked. Do you think this is the word of God or don't you? Because if you don't, you're saying that God shouldn't be able to tell you to do an evil thing. And if you do, you're saying he should. In either case, faith falls as a reinforcement of ordinary morality. Um, recently, uh, Dr. McGrath is a member of uh, the Church of England, the Anglican Communion, the Episcopalian Communion, what George Herbert, what my favorite religious poet after John Donne, uh, the sweet mediocrity of our native church was how he referred to uh, uh, the Sea of Canterbury. Everyone thinks it's the mildest of all. It, it not only uh, calls itself a flock, it looks very sheep-like. Um, however, the Bishop of Carlisle recently, the tipped, I'm told, to be the next Archbishop of Canterbury, said that the floods in northern Yorkshire that devastated a large part of England in the summer um, and killed and dis dispossessed large number of people were punishment for homosexuality. Now, to connect meteorology to morality seems to me, I have to say, flat out idiotic whichever way you do it. If there was a connection between meteorology and morality, which religion has very often argued that there is, I don't see why the floods hit northern Yorkshire. I can think of some parts of London where they would have done a lot more good, <laughs> just as the hurricane that devastated uh, New Orleans, we found punishment for sin as it must have been left the French Quarter alone. You have to make up your mind on this. You either think God intervenes or he doesn't. I'm clear. I say, I don't think so. Will Dr. McGrath say that he does intervene and that we can tell when he does, or will he not say so? You have to ask him. You have to hear his answer. Does he say sometimes intervenes? Or do you say he moves in mysterious ways? My position is clear. His remains, I think, distinctly opaque. It was the Archbishop of Canterbury, Geoffrey Fisher, who said the following that a nuclear war, thermonuclear war, would only hasten our transition into a more blessed state into which we were bound to eventuate anyway. If I had told you that remark and asked you to guess, you would have said Mahmoud Ahmadinejad said it, or some other fanatical verminous mullah. No, the Archbishop of Canterbury said it, and why shouldn't he? Because an another immoral and sinister thing about religion is that lurking un under it at all times, in every one of its versions, is a desire for this life to come to an end for this poor world to be over. The yearning, the secret death wish that's in all of it, let this be gone, let us move to the next stage, is present at all times, unless it's repudiated, which I invite Dr. McGrath to do. But if he does so, I don't see in what eschatological sense he can claim to remain a Christian. And he can't take it a la carte. If you claim or accept the one version, you have to accept the other. If it's true in general that religion does one thing and some people do good from it, then you have to accept all the wicked acts that are attributable to it as well. And I think you'll find that those don't quite equalize at the margin, depressing though that conclusion would be. I have a challenge which I have now put in print on the Christianity Today website, in Holy Blossom Synagogue in Toronto the night before last, in many other places, and on the air and on the web, and it's this. If it's to be argued that our, our morality, our ethics, can be derived from the supernatural, um, then name me an action, a moral action, taken by a believer, 
or moral statement <coughs> uttered by one that could not have been made or uttered by an infidel, an unbeliever. I have tried this everywhere. On a large number of people, I've not yet had even one reply. But if I was to ask you, can you think of a wicked action that could only have been performed by someone who believed they were on an errand from God, there isn't one of you who would take 10 seconds to think of an example. And what does that tell us? I would, I would say it tells us a lot. And here's the bogus answer to it that was only very gently mentioned by Dr. McGrath this evening. Well, what about atheist nihilism? What about atheist cruelty? What about 20th century totalitarianism? I take this seriously enough to have put a chapter in my book about it, available, by the way, at fine bookstores everywhere. <laughs> and I'll, I can only summarize it now, and I'll do so very as, as tersely as I can. First, <clears throat> fascism, the original 20th century totalitarian movement, is really, historically, another name for the, for the political activity of the Catholic right wing. There is no other name for it. Francoism, Salazarism, what happened in Croatia, in Austria, in Bavaria, and so on. The church keeps on trying to apologize for it, can't apologize for it enough. It's the Catholic right, Mussolini. You can't quite say that about Hitler, National Socialism, because that's also based on Nordic and pagan blood myths, uh, leader worship, and so on, though Hitler never repudiated his membership of the church. Um, and prayers were said for him on his birthday every year till the very end on the orders of the Vatican. Uh, and all of these facts are well known and the church still hasn't found another a way to apologize for that enough. And whatever it is, you can call that, you can't call it secular. You may not call it secular. By the way, Joseph Goebbels was excommunicated from the Catholic Church. 50 percent, according to Paul Johnson, the Catholic historian of the Waffen SS, were confessing Catholics. None of them was ever threatened with excommunication, even threatened for it, with it for taking part in the final solution. But Joseph Goebbels was excommunicated for marrying a Protestant. You see, we do have our standards. Now, okay, moving to Marxism, moving to Leninism. Okay. In Russia, in 1917, for hundreds of years, millions of people have been told the head of the state is a supernatural power. The Tsar is not just the head of the government, not just a king, but he stands between heaven and earth. Uh, and this, this has been inculcated in generations of Russians for hundreds of years. If you're Joseph Stalin, himself a seminarian from Georgia, you shouldn't be in the totalitarianism business if you can't exploit ready-made reservoir of credulity and servility that's as big as that. It's just waiting for you to capitalize on. So what do you do? Well, we'll have an inquisition for one thing. We'll have miracles for another. Lysenko's biology will produce four harvests a year. We'll have heresy hunts. We'll tell everyone they must be grateful only to the leader for what they get, and they must thank him and praise him all the time. And that they must be aware all the time of the existence of the counter-revolutionary devil who waits to... You see where I'm going with this? That's not secularism. Um, Michael? Oh, do I need really two? Okay. Um, I'll tell you my North Korea stories another time. Here's the, it's surrogate, it is at the very best and the very worst, the examples I've been talking about are a surrogate for messianism, for the belief in ultimate history and the end of days and the conclusion of all things, which is, I've tried to argue, I hope with some success, the problem to begin with, the replacement of reason by faith, the discarding of the one thing that makes us important and useful and different from other primates in favor of something that requires no evidence and just requires incantation. Not good for you. If Dr. McGrath or anyone else could come up with an example of a society which had fallen into slavery and bankruptcy and beggary and terror and misery because it had adopted the teachings and the precepts of Spinoza and Einstein and Pierre Bile and Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine, then I'd be impressed, and that would be a fair test on a level playing field, but you will find no such example. Indeed, the nearest such example we do have is these great United States, the first country in the world to have a constitution that forbids the mention of religion in the public square, except by way of limiting it and saying that the state can take no interest in establishment of faith. Best known in, under the rubric of the wall of separation, my new slogan is Mr. Jefferson, build up that wall. <laughs> Hope you'll join me in it very quickly in my last minute. Yes, Dr. McGrath, you're right. There is something about us as a species that is problematic and isn't just explained by religion. There's something about us that tempts us to do wrong. It's pretty easily explained, I think. We are 
We are primates, high primates, but primates. We are half a chromosome away from chimpanzees, and it shows. It especially shows in the number of religions we invent to console ourselves or to give us things to quarrel with other primates about. If anything demonstrates that God is man-made, not man-God-made, surely it is the religions erected by this quasi-chimpanzee species and the harm that they're willing to inflict on that basis. I think on the point of, um, of uh, Christology that you closed with, I ought not to take any more of the audience's time but be prepared to discuss, and I hope I've yielded back some of my time to questions, and I'm grateful again for your indulgence. Thank you. Well, Mr. Hitchens uh, posed quite a few questions for me in his opening address, and so let me just begin to wrestle with them. What do I think about the resurrection? Do I think it as being metaphorical? Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I think, and, and you can um, make up your own minds about this. I think the resurrection is a historical event. Something that happened in history was seen as intriguing, but not obviously interpreted as something of dramatic significance. The key question was not simply the history, but also its meaning. And so in the New Testament, for example, we see debates taking place around the time of the resurrection, which are primarily concerned, what does this mean? In other words, something seems to have happened, but it's a historical event. What is the overall meaning of this event? And so for me, that, that second question begins to emerge as being of major importance. And in the New Testament, we see a number of ideas beginning to emerge. The most important of these is that in some way, Jesus had been demonstrated to have some sort of relationship with God that validated his teaching. In other words, that authorized him to speak with authority on what God was like. It's a bit like you know, interpreting something like uh, Caesar crossing the Rubicon. I mean, you can think of that as having two different elements. On the one hand, there is the physical event, the crossing of a river, which, of course, in this case is not particularly difficult. But then there is its historical significance in that the Rubicon marked the boundary between um, the Roman colonies and Rome itself. To cross that with an army was, in effect, a declaration of war. So for me, an historical event with a deeper theological significance. And that significance, it seems to me, is articulated by the New Testament in terms of, first of all, who Jesus Christ is, but secondly, also, what the implications of this might be for human nature. And of course, the Christian hope of eternal life, the very strong New Testament declaration that we are people who have hope is very much grounded on that particular idea. Now, um, Mr. Hitchens has moved on and began to talk, I think, very interestingly about God as a celestial dictator. And again, I think that is a very significant idea. Now, certainly, I hear what he's saying, but for me, God is a celestial liberator. And I wonder if we have a very different perspective on this same event. Is there a real difference here which we can justify in terms of metaphysics, or is this simply a different perspective on how we see things? Um, Mr. Uh, uh, sorry. <coughs> uh, Mr. Hitchens clearly uh, is emphasizing that religion can do some bad things, and I want to say that I believe he is right to alert us to that and to avoid any uncritical evaluation of religion. But there is this deeper side, which I do want to just emphasize. The New Testament talks about the truth setting you free. It talks about the glorious liberty of the children of God. And maybe we've lost that. Maybe somehow we've bound this up with all kinds of rituals and so on, so have lost sight of it. But as you read the New Testament, I think there is this outburst of energy, of liberation, that something has happened which has transformed the human situation, brought hope, and at the same time liberated us from fear of death and also to do some very very good things. Certainly we fail, certainly we fall. But for me, I think the idea of God's celestial dictator is one that I don't really recognize myself, although I can see where it's coming from. And Mr. Hitchens then went on and issued a very powerful challenge against religion as any form of wishful thinking that provides consolation. 
And again, he makes a number of points that I think are perfectly fair. One of these is that wishful thinking is precisely that. It's what we would like to be the case. It bears no relation to what actually is the case. And also, he makes the point that consolation is, well, well, I put it like this, it's for losers, isn't it? Certainly when I was an atheist myself, I very much took the view that religion was for mad, bad, or sad people. And certainly you can see that emphasis and consolation would correspond very well with that third group. But I think there are some points we need to look at. The historical roots of this argument go back to Ludwig Feuerbach in the year 1841, when he wrote his very famous book uh, dealing with the essence of Christianity. And in that book, he argues very lucidly along the lines Mr. Hitchens indicated, that people believe in God because in some way this is about their aspirations, their hopes, their longings being actualized when of course there is no God to believe in. It's simply we wish it were like this, but we know it's not and we're in denial. So that belief in God is seen as the projection of some imaginary finger, figure on some transcendent screen. Now I think Feuerbach does make an important point. But I want to make two points in response. Number one, the fact that we might wish something to be true certainly does not make it true. But the fact that we wish something to be true does not make it false for that reason. I mean, for example, you can hear my voice is beginning to dry up, and I would very much like there to be some water, and there is still some left, I'm pleased to say. Um, but the point is, my desire does not negate the reality. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> I'll turn away and come to five. <laughs> But I think more interestingly is this, I wonder, I wonder if atheism might also be a form of wishful thinking. Now, again, those who study cultural history will know that one of the points that's very often made is that the, the emergence of atheism as a significant historical phenomenon in the 18th century was this deep desire to change things. If there were no God, we could do as we please. You all know Dostoevsky's Possessed where um, Krylov makes this following comment. If there is a God, I must do what God wants. But if there is no God, I do what I want. And again, you can see atheism there as a kind of ethic of liberation. I'm able to do what I please. There are no limits. And again, uh, you may have come across that very interesting essay uh, by Czeslo Milos in the New York Times book review about uh, 10 years ago called The Discreet Charm of Nihilism where he says, look, what has captivated us today is not the idea of religion as an escape from reality, but the idea that there is no God and hence no accountability, so we do what we please, we are accountable to nobody. So I wonder if this argument actually works both ways. I think it's certainly a very interesting possibility to explore. Now, Mr. Hitchens then moved on to talk about uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, he made a point which I think is an is interesting point and one that I need to engage with. Mount Sinai, he said, look, changed everything. Are we to understand that people had no moral sense before this, that somehow this brought uh, morality into being? And I think what well, I would say, and I think most Christian theologians would say something like this, is that both the Old and the New Testaments are very, very clear that there was human wisdom around long before Sinai, that to use Paul's imagery, that we are judged on the basis of what we do know where there is no knowledge of the law. What I would want to say is that um, uh, the Old Testament and indeed the New Testament do not kind of throw something down and say, there, that's it, you didn't know about this before. But to, to quote from that very interesting document, Fides et Ratio, Faith and Reason, uh, originating from the, the late Pope. I mean, that in some way, grace does not abolish nature, but rather perfects it. In other words, it brings to fulfillment these basic human instincts about what is right and what is wrong, correcting them when necessary, but still fulfilling these longings for righteousness, this desire to do what is right, which I believe to be so fundamental a part of human nature. 
And therefore, for me, uh, the Christian faith, for example, does not kind of way throw down a series of arbitrary dictates, but rather it builds on what is already there precisely because for Christianity, we are all God's creation, and God has planted, if you like, signals or reminders of what he is like. Or to use that wonderful phrase from Gerard Mane Hopkins, in some way, nature and humanity is instressed with the likeness of God. We then move on to uh, talk about uh, something that um, I think uh, I touched on, uh, Mr. Richardson's talked about the tension between science and faith. I think I may have touched on that in my own talk, so I won't repeat that now, other than to say that for me, there is a very healthy convergence and mutual enrichment between science and faith. But finally, he also uh, made a point, which is basically that it seems very unjust that Christianity teaches that redemption depends on explicit response to a gospel that's preached when so many haven't heard it. And I, I would certainly agree that that does seem very unjust. But again, the Christian tradition down the ages has been that the proclamation of the gospel brings things to fulfillment. But where it has not been heard, we are judged on the basis of what we do know and how we respond to it. Again, grace does not abolish nature, but perfects it. Thank you. Well, thank you, gentlemen. This is where we now have a conversation. And I have got some questions from the audience, and if there are other questions, I'm glad to receive them. But I have some here. Now, the first question, obviously, is for you, Christopher. Uh, since Mr. McGrath has just finished, I would put the question to you, which is, if, if God does not exist, on what basis can anyone say this action is right or this action is wrong? So whoever asked that only just came into the room, right? I can't believe that I didn't say what I thought about it. But, but I won't repeat it because actually what Dr. McGrath just said I thought was unusually good on this point. You'll recall what he said on the Dostoevsky matter. Um, if God exists, we have to do what he says. If he doesn't, we can do what we like. Now, just apply this for a second in practice and in theory. Um, is it not said of God's chosen people and is it not said to, uh, to them by God in the Pentateuch that they can do exactly as they like to other people? They can enslave them, they can take their land, they can take their women, they can destroy all their young men, they can help themselves to all their virgins, they can do what anyone who had no sense of anything but their, their own rights would be able to do, but in this case with divine permission. Doesn't that make it somewhat more evil? In Iran, where I've been, I've been to all three axes of evil countries, uh, by the way, and th I think I'm the only writer who can say that. You're not allowed to sentence a woman who is a virgin to death, even though she may have committed, in the eyes of the mullahs, a capital crime, perhaps by showing her hair too often or her limbs. She can't be sentenced to death. But religious law means she can be raped by the revolutionary guards and she's not a virgin anymore. And then they can kill her. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, used to be considered the motto of Satanism, as I recall. Divine permission given to people who think they have God on their side enables actions that a normal, morally normal unbeliever would not contemplate. The mutilation of genitalia of children. Who would do that if it wasn't decided that God wanted it? Just as when the poet in England gets the poet laureate ship, they start to write drivel instead of poetry, for some reason. It's the, it's the king's scrofula the other way around. Morally normal and intelligent people find themselves saying fatuously wicked things when this subject comes up. The suicide bombing community is entirely faith-based. The genital mutilation community is entirely faith-based. Slavery is mandated by the Bible. People keep, you keep hearing how many abolitionists were Christians. Well, it was about time that they took a stand against it, having mandated it for so long. So it's, 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 it's not even a tautology, I think, to say that there's, a, that, uh, there's a, a relationship between the human impulse to do evil, to be selfish, to be self-centered, to be greedy, and a co contrast between that and faith, because given only faith, mountains can be moved, 
and millions of people who would never normally acquiesce in evil are brought to it straight away and with ease and with self-righteousness. There, that's my answer to that. And, and the questioner did not answer my challenge. Name an ethical statement made or action performed by a believer in the name of faith that couldn't have been by an, an infidel and name, if you can, this is easier, a wicked action that could only be mandated by faith and then you'll see how silly your question was, wherever you were. Well, let me ask it then. Uh, Christopher, did you, you, you heard Professor McGrath also, though, uh, condemn any form of religious violence. Well, that's easy to do. I mean, uh, I could say, look, an atheist can be a nihilist. No, I think there's a, a room for agreement here between the two of you. I'm, not, I'm not looking for consensus, baby. I'm just not in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in the vein, as King Richard says. Yeah. <laughs> not in the vein. No. <laughs> I'm glad he condemns religious violence. Does he condemn the promise of other people's territory to the, the chosen people, for example? Does Jesus say, or does he not say, I come to bring not peace but a sword? He does say that. Should I take it literally or metaphorically? Right? Yeah. Is, is genital mutilation of small boys mandated by Jews, and is it uh, often mandated by Muslims, or not? Uh, is there a paradise to which people can hope to get by dying for their faith, or isn't there? Uh, has holy war been proclaimed by both the Pope and by the mullahs or not? Um, you put a lot these are problems not for me. It, for me, it's simple. We're primates. This is what we would expect to happen if there was no God. Let me, uh, let me this is what we would expect to see if, the, if faith was pointless. Mm -hmm. but, for, but it's, a, it's an endless mystery where none exists if you think there's an intervening finger from on high. Then it becomes mysterious. Thank you. Okay, Don't quite. Mention. You're welcome. <laughs> for Professor McGrath. <laughs> Uh, here's a question. I would like to hear you expound on Mr. Hitchens' claim that the idea of a vicarious sacrifice is immoral or unethical. What is Christianity's explanation of this? Certainly. Well, the, the phrase vicarious sacrifice isn't actually a biblical phrase. It's a phrase that's used by some writers to refer to a particular interpretation of a biblical teaching. And the key idea in the New Testament is that in some way the death of Christ, again violence done to Christ, not violence done by Christ, is seen as having a transformative potential uh, for human beings. And this transformative potential is articulated using a range of models, some of which are drawn from the Old Testament. For example, uh, there's a, a, an analogy drawn with animal sacrifice, and that is seen as in some way uh, bring, establishing a link between Christ's death and the bringing of the possibility of purity to someone. That is one uh, of the images used. Others include, for example, the whole idea of um, healing, the idea of being set in a right relationship with God. There are a wide range of these. Now, Mr. Hitchens' uh, particular criticism... Which of them is yours? I'd really like to know. And I'll tell you right now. Um, no, please. To make sure that I um, do justice to both the question asked and your criticism made. For me, and I will speak now very personally because I think I've been sure. uh, invited to and I'm very happy to do that. For me, the death of Christ on the cross means that something that I could never gain for myself has been done for me and offered to me. In other words, it is something that um, uh, by myself as a, a human being I could never hope to achieve is achieved on my behalf and offered to me and I am asked, will you accept what has been done for you. In other words, it is about the possibility of transformation being offered to me but not being imposed upon me. And for me, that is a, about a, a God who offers but does not demand that I respond to him in this way. And I find that to be a, a very good summary of what the Christian faith is trying to say about a God who offers but does not impose. And again, those of you who are familiar with the New Testament will think of the imagery of Revelation chapter 3, which speaks of Christ knocking on the door and asking us to open, but leaving that action up, uh, open to us. Okay. Mr. Hitchens. Not imposed. Did you really say not imposed? What if you reject this offer? What are you told by, what have you been told for centuries by Christians? If you reject this offer that took place by means of a torture to death of a human being that you didn't want and should have prevented if you could, what if you reject the offer? If you, if, you, if you accept it, you can have eternal life and your sins are forgiven. Oh, great. What a horrible way 
to abolish your own responsibility and get your own bliss. I don't want it. Oh, you don't? Well, then you can go to hell. This is not imposed. This hasn't been preached to children by, by gruesome elderly virgins with, backed by force for centuries. <laughs> hasn't po hasn't, this hasn't poisoned whole societies. No, imp of course it's, imp it's not voluntary. The, uh, uh, the Pope of Rome, as I call the Bishop of Rome, Ra Mr. Ratzinger, Herr Ratzinger, has recently said, actually, it's worse than that. Only my version of Christianity can get you salvation. And there is only one way. I say it in Georgetown. There's only one. You presumably don't believe that because you're an Anglican. But on what basis do you tell the Pope that he's a heretic? Once you grant this stuff, once you start with this white noise chat about redemption, where is it going to end? Of course there's nothing voluntary about it. And <laughs> I must say, the book of Revelation seems one of the less uh, voluntary texts of the... It, all it does is look forward gleefully to apocalypse, um, to, the, to the passing away of this veil of uh, tears into our ultimate destruction. This is morality? I don't think so. Well, I think if I could just build on that, because I think, I think a, a very interesting line of discussion has opened up here. Um, number one, um, I, I, I think um, I, I do challenge your reading of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is very much saying to Christians who are being persecuted for their faith by a secular authority, who are in effect being, being uh, victimized, that this is not the way it's going to remain, that one day there will be an inversion of the world order. It's in effect an encouragement to those who are suffering. And again, I make my point again that Christianity is saying, look, here is an offer. It is yours to accept or not. Uh, I, I take it you do not believe in hell or anything like that. And therefore, I, I don't see what the difficulty is for you personally. It is not about imposition. <laughs> But you're in the right church, but the wrong pew. I mean, I've, yes, I've, of course I've emancipated myself from all that nonsense. I, I wish you would do too. I'm saying, what is the belief? And when you say it's voluntary, it's up to you. It's entirely optional. I don't think it's any more optional than Abraham saying to his son, do you want to come for a long and gloomy walk? <laughs> because God seems to be telling me to do something that had better be moral. Otherwise, it would have to be said that God had taken a perfectly normal person and asked him to commit an atrocity. Now, where else could that have come from? And millions of people every year celebrate this act of sadomasochism as if it proved that God loved us so much that he'd make us kill our own children, and then he decides to love us so much he'll kill one of his own. You said in a debate with Richard Dawkins, I, I have it down, you said the great thing about God is he knows what it's like to lose a son. Now, I also want the, you ladies and gentlemen to ponder that expression for just a moment. First, it's self-evidently, if the story is the true, which I don't think it is, it's self-evidently not the case, even in the narrative. He doesn't lose a son. He lends one. He doesn't offer one because no one's demanded it. There's no problem that has so far been identified in the human species that demands a human sacrifice. For what problem, for what ill is this a cure? There's no argument, there's no evidence. There. No, it's imposed. I'm doing this because the prophets said I would and I'm, I'm going to have the boy tortured to death in public to fulfill ancient screeds of, of Bronze Age Judaism. But, but wait, I don't want it. I don't need it. I don't feel better for it. I feel very uneasy about it. Well, that's a pity, because then you're going to be cast into eternal fire. This is no way to talk. I don't like to be addressed in that tone of voice. So, <laughs> I have well, me, to, me, to me, all me. this, I have to return a slight non servian if I may be so bold, and take my chances morally, that that's the more ethical thing to do. Don't feeling. want torture, don't want human sacrifice, don't want authoritarian bloodlettings, smoking temples and altars, incantations of priests and, uh, around all this. Don't want it. Can't think of a single thing it will make better about our, Let me see a professor our veil of tears. Yes. Oh, yes, by all means. Yes. Thanks. Sorry if I bang on a bit about this. No, I, I, don't worry, I'll interrupt. Go ahead. I don't want those things either, and I think that uh, nobody here really would. I think that uh, one can interpret these things in these ways. You, you do, and I, I appreciate that. But I want to make the point there are many other ways of looking at these within the Christian tradition, and that it's very important to say that um, you know, there are other ways of making sense of this, and I think we need to get some of them on the table.
for me, uh, and again, I, I'd want to emphasize this point, uh, the Christian vision of God is not a God who leaves us on our own, but a God who chooses to enter into time and history where we are in order to make possible for us, if we want it, a transformation of our situation. After 98,000 years? I don't see any... Of abstention? I don't see any need to say this leads to torture or anything like that. If it does, that needs to be challenged. But the point for me is, this is about something being offered to us with enormous potential for change. Let me ask a question of Mr. Hitchens. As someone who considers himself a high primate, <laughs> it seems strange that you would consider loving and witnessing the truth an obligation. Would you explain how a soulless primate can have any obligations? Well, it's a, it's a, a question one often asks oneself. Uh, for example, why do I care? You know? um, why do I mind about other primates? I think I know that because I hope that they will, at the very lowest, I would say, because I hope they'll mind about me in return. I mean, I'll give you an example. Why should they? Well, why indeed? Um, why does one do the right thing, or what one hopes is the right thing, when no one's looking? Why does a Muslim cab driver go to all the trouble to come back to my apartment building when I didn't have his number to return a large sum of money I left on his back seat, said it was his religious duty? But if I allow him to say that that's his religious duty, what am I going to say when he says it's his religious duty to veil his wife? Or to blow himself up? Um, or to impose Sharia law? If you grant it once, you have to grant the whole thing. You can't do it a la carte. Now, I'll give you an example from my old socialist days. This will bring the uh, moisture to the eyes of Dr. McGrath as well. Um, <laughs> It was our favorite example, uh, Professor Peter Townsend's book on the gift relationship, you remember? Why does the British National Health Service never run out of blood, though you're not allowed to charge for it? You have to give it free. Never runs out of blood. Because people like to give blood. They want to feel useful. I like to do it. I like it very much. Um, and I'm not a masochist, and I don't particularly like being stuck. But I lose, I like the way that I lose, uh, someone gains a pint and I don't lose one, because I replenish it quite quickly. Someone's instantly better off I haven't had to abnegate myself by giving anything away. Um, I like the fact that I'm helping someone who I don't know. And as it happens, I have a very rare blood group, indeed. And one day I'm going to have to count on other people feeling the same way. So human solidarity will get you quite a long way ethically. And there's every reason why that should be in our genes, in our, in our, in our so to speak, inscribed. We wouldn't have got this far if we didn't have these qualities. To say we couldn't have them without celestial permission seems to me to be simply slavish. And if we're all made in God's image, then how come there are so many sociopaths who don't notice the existence of other people, or so many psychopaths for whom it's a positive pleasure to inflict pain? Uh, none of these, all of these are easily, easily solved questions if you make the assumption of evolution by natural selection and consider us as an animal species. If you detect the finger of God in all this, you invent myriad problems that do not exist and cannot be solved, and that are actually a waste of our mentality. Occam's razor disposes of all the supernatural assumptions that have ever been made. We have better and more elegant explanations for everything that happens in our cosmos and in our biology now. And if we'd had these to begin with, there would never have been a foothold for the death cult of Christianity or Islam or Judaism. Well, President perhaps I could just um, take us on the stage further. I mean, I think what you, you seem to be saying is that we are able to offer a, a complete scientific account of things which eliminates any place for the transcendent. And I, I want, if I no, could... No, 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 sorry, if I may. Not that I, I wanted to speak to this, and I will later, but mm. transcendent and the numinous are very important. They're not to be confused with the supernatural. Um, I, I would want to say that the word transcendent means a number of different things, and certainly the supernatural ca can be one of those. But it can also mean some sort of sense that there is something beyond us. And I don't think we need to use the word supernatural. I'm thinking of Iris Murdoch's idea in, for example, The Sovereignty of Good, where she tries to posit something which, um, 
which, though beyond us, nevertheless elicits a response to us. Uh, for example, in trying to articulate what the, the notion of good actually is. And it seems to me that, that science actually is extremely good at clarifying the relationship between the different levels of the material order. But when it comes to questions of meaning or value, which might well include transcendent meanings, it actually doesn't really help us very much. And so I'd want to suggest that actually science offers us one level of explanation of the way things are, but it does not prevent us from adding extra levels of meaning on top of that. And it seems to me that that is one of the reasons why one can talk about the uh, dynamic interaction between science and religion, because they are certainly engaging with the same reality, but they're offering different perspectives or different levels of engagement with that same thing. Okay. You have a response to that a bit? No. Okay. I think it should stand alone. Um, no, next, I would say. Yes, okay. Uh, Professor McGrath, this is the next question. You said that acts of violence in the name of God come from the fringes of religion. But God has ordered many acts of violence, for instance, in the Old Testament, that killed thousands. Is God on the fringe of his own religion? Well, clearly the, the way that um, question is phrased actually, in effect, answers itself. Uh, I would not wish to um, uh, say that quite like that, and therefore I'd like to try and um, offer an answer which goes like this. Um, I'm a Christian, and obviously I read the Old Testament. And one of the questions is, how on earth do I make sense of those passages which seem to, at least on the face of it, authorize um, acts of killing and so on, which I personally find very, very um, disagreeable. And for me as a Christian, as I was saying, uh, a fundamental theme here is that Christ is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. In other words, not simply that he brings to fulfillment their intentions, but that in some way he is authorized to show us what these are really meant to be like. In other words, that there are other interpretations, but these are relativized or placed to one side because of who Jesus is and what he did. And therefore, I would want to look at the Old Testament through this lens and say that I believe it allows us to, to look at these passages and challenge the most natural interpretations. For me, one of the great themes of Christian history is the idea that, or what do I call progressive revelation, that we gain a firmer understanding of what God is like as time goes on, and above all, for example, through the revelation of Christ. And again, whether you're a Protestant or a Catholic, you might talk about the uh, continued guidance of the Holy Spirit or indeed continued reflection on the part of the church. But the engagement of Scripture is dynamic and ongoing. It's not really something that, that's been ended in the past. Okay, for Mr. Hitchens. Why um, oh, oh, sorry, uh, can I comment on that just briefly? Or yes, you sure Was can. I not invited to do so? Please do so. Don't let me... Well, I mean, some of the early Christian church fathers, I think, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, I think Marcion was, was among them, did contemplate starting a movement that was just basically Christian, based on what was understood or believed about the, the apparent very opaque brief life of Jesus of Nazareth, and not inherit, not force upon themselves, as St. Paul had suggested, uh, the ghastly, gruesome uh, Jewish books of the Old Testament, to start again. I think they might have done better to, to do that, because having decided that they inherit all that, they do inherit, in particular, the, the most wicked and immoral doctrine of the, of the lot, which is original sin in Adam and the expiation by the sacrifice of children, human sacrifice of children, than which I don't think any morally normal person can think of anything more repulsive. So that it is, I'm afraid, innate that there is to be cruelty and violence and fanaticism. Uh, in, in the religion, and the, the responsibility is not expiable. Bizarrely, I mean, many people think, well, the Old Testament is true, it's full of bloodletting, it recommends genocide, extermination, slavery, or dispossession, all of these things. The New Testament is more meek and mild. I've given you my comment on that. It, it, it's the first time that hell is mentioned. But it is in the Christian version that another whole different kind of immorality is proposed, a worse kind of immorality yet, which is the the wicked idea of non-resistance to evil and the, and the deranged idea that we should love our enemies. Nothing, nothing could be more suicidal and immoral than that. We, ha we have to defend ourselves and our children and our civilization from our enemies. We have to learn to, uh, to educate ourselves in a, in a cold, steady dislike of them and a determination to encompass their destruction. Who, who here 
heard anyone after September the 11th in holy orders actually say, oh, well, we must turn around to love these people. Did they dare say that then? Of course not. They saw the emptiness and the futility and the immorality of what they would have been caught saying if they'd even tried it. Um, we have to bear all this stuff in mind. This is not moral teaching at all. We have to survive our enemies. We have to learn to destroy them, especially because they too are motivated by the hectic, maniacal ideas of monotheism, which really seeks and yearns for the destruction of our planet and the end of days. And that's why it's not moral. And that's why we have to outgrow it and defeat it. I, I have a feeling you want to comment. Well, I'd like to comment. Um, first of all, I, I do not think that the principle of trying to love your enemies uh, leads to these things at all. I think it, if anything, leads to the obviation of violence. It does not mean we have to ignore moral issues. It means that we see these people as human beings as someone who, in effect, bears the right. same flesh and blood as us. Right. And it may right. mean that we want to try and resolve the issue, saying we believe you are wrong, but it's also trying to avoid dehumanization. And it seems to me this, is, this really is a very significant question I'd like to pursue, that, I mean, I may have misunderstood you, but what you seem to be proposing is to see your enemies in dehumanized form. And for me as a Christian, I, I could not do that, because I have to see even my enemies as those who God has made and loved, and therefore, even though I, I, I may dislike them intensely, I have to show that love and compassion towards them and see them as human beings, not as the other, the enemy. Uh, I, I think, really, that there's more to this there's idea no than to you suggest. There's no need to dehumanize people who are set on dehumanizing themselves and on the murder of others and on a cult of death. There's no need to de They've done all that for them. So. But what do you like someone once accused me of trying to assassinate his character, and I said, no, your character committed suicide a long time ago. <laughs> uh, they've done the dehumanizing work for us, thanks, and they are fellow primates, of course. There's no question of uh, redefining them as another species, but there is a very important question of whether we intend to assert our own values as superior to theirs and as worth defending against them. And Christianity, with this, the sickly relativism, that you've stressed so often this evening, disarms us for this very important struggle. That's why the Archbishop of Canterbury is this week groveling at the feet of, uh, of the mullahs in Iran, and saying we should leave them alone and the, must try not to hurt their feelings, as he groveled at the feet of Saddam Hussein, as actually every Christian church has been doing in the recent past, saying, well, you know, faith, faith is better than um, no faith. Any faith is better than none. They all agreed to condemn Salman Rushdie for blasphemy rather than the people who tried to kill him for money, for writing a novel, for example. They all, they all condemn the Danish cartoons because blasphemy against any faith is an offense to Let, all. Could I interrupt you here on this? Okay, point? well, this is very serious, ladies and gentlemen, well, because this stuff it. could kill you. Okay? Yes, Christopher, I've heard you at yourself at one of my own conferences expound at great length on the Christian well, just war, mm -hmm. at the Christian just war tradition. You seem to have left that whole rich tradition out of what you just called. Yeah, but it's Christian, I think the Christian just war tradition is, is a nonsensical tautology. It, it says you can only go to war when you're, when you're sure you're in the right, when you're sure you can win, when you're sure the, the violence is going to be proportional and so on. You can't know any of this. Aquinas couldn't have known it, nor could the later uh, thinkers about it, like Grotius. They couldn't have known. They said, Would, wouldn't it be nice? It's, it's just wishful thinking again. I know a just war when I see one. And we're engaged in one now. And our faith-based forces are of no, are about as, as much use as the Pope's bulls in this struggle. Well, we're okay. getting a little off course here, but... Uh... I know. <laughs> I had a feeling it might come up. I, I wanted this to come up. <laughs> you know, we've, uh, we've actually gone over time, and I feel like we could stay till about uh, 10 o'clock, but... Uh... I'm not in a hurry. I've got no idea. Yeah. <laughs> My mission statement is I won't go till any, if anyone can claim that I didn't answer a question. So... Well, there are a lot of on, people here. Well, we, I'll be on the steps outside having a smoke and a miniature. <laughs> I, uh, I, we've, uh, we've got, we were going to go 15 Was minutes over. More? Uh, well, it was for you, but uh, I, I've, I'll tell you what, I'll let you comment on this, and then we'll let uh, Professor Graff make some final comments, and then I think we can be in agreement we should do this again. I think we just got started. Would you both be agreeable to doing that? Sure. Mm -hmm. You all would come back, wouldn't you? Mr. That was Hitchens, my, that was why, my daughter saying that. Oh, sorry. Why would, uh, 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 Mr. Hitchens, why would scientific discoveries about the origin of the universe obviate the existence of God? Well, they don't in and of themselves, but it, I just would submit, I, I really will be quick this time, and I, I know I've been a little verbose up till now. Um, 
the likelihood that what Edwin Hubble saw through that telescope, the red light escaping at speeds that you, none of us here are capable of really imagining, the, to, towards the, the ultimate expansion and collapse of the universe and the, the heat death of the whole thing, that, that all that happened so we could be sitting here is to me in the very, very highest degree improbable. Um, that a process of evolution by natural selection just on our own tiny little planet which in its own tiny little solar system is the only one on which life can be supported. Everywhere else, just in our little system, all the other rocks are either much too hot or much too cold to support life, as is much of our planet, which we know has for a long time been, not recently either, on a climatic knife edge, and which is still cooling. Only one. And on this planet, 99.8% of every species that ever evolved died out. This is an extraordinary way, I think, to make sure that Homo sapiens comes to Georgetown. Um, it, it is the mo only the most extraordinarily self-centered species could imagine that all this was going on for our sake. That's why I don't like people saying that their religious faith is modest or humble. It's the reverse. It's unbelievably solipsistic. And that's why you get people apparently abject, much too abject for my taste, like Mother Teresa. Oh, I'm so humble I can hardly bother to feed myself, you know. But out of my way because I'm on a mission for God. No. This is arrogance, as a matter of fact, and it claims to know what it cannot know. I could say that Einstein was right when he said, the miracle is of the natural order, the miracle is there are no miracles. Understand this paradox. The natural order doesn't interrupt itself. The sun doesn't stand still at midday. God doesn't catch a child as the kid falls out of a window or, do any, or heal lepers randomly. And none of that ever happens. The miracle is there's a force that holds it all together that's consistent and unvarying. That's wonderful. Okay, he may show there's a mind somewhere in the universe. But to say we know what that mind is, to move from the deist position to the theist one, we know what God wants us to eat or not eat. We know in what positions he wants us to make love or with whom. We know his instructions on it is an unbelievable piece of conceit. And in my opinion, it's the reason why um, I may be a very poor spokesman for my side of this argument, but I think anyone who thinks about it has to vote that given the amount of uncertainty that we have, and given how much we now know, how much more we know, about how little we know, the definition of education and our civilization. The only people who have to lose in this argument are those who say they do know and who claim, yes, I do know what God wants, I do think he sent a son, I do think there was a resurrection, I do think there's salvation, claiming to know things they cannot conceivably know. I mean, to put it in a mild way, if Dr. McGrath has such extraordinary sources of information as the ones he's claimed to have available to him, I can't understand why he's only occupying a chair at Oxford University. Well, you I should be, you, that, with, with the knowledge you've got, you should be a real mech. And uh, I'm afraid you don't know any more than I do about whether there was ever a Jesus of Nazareth, a resurrection, a miracle, a virgin birth. Or you couldn't know any more than I do. You can't. You just claim that you do. I'm afraid that that, that means, I think, that you, you lose this round. Well, <laughs> if I could respond. Um, to deal with the first point before we came on to that second one, I don't think it's at all solipsistic to say, let's reflect on why we are here. Let's reflect on why there is something rather than nothing. It's to ask a very important question about how the universe came into being. Why is there something rather than nothing? I mean, for Wittgenstein, that was a hugely important question. And it seems to me to be entirely right to answer that question, or at least to try and answer it. On my own status, I mean, I appreciate very much the, the compliment you pay, uh, but I'm, I'm simply making the point that all of us are interpreters of what we observe. I made it very, very clear. I was not making any claims to special knowledge. I was looking at what I saw, what others say. I interpret it in this way. I claim no privilege. I say it is my judgment that this is the best explanation, and it means this, and I'm open to challenge on this, as you have challenged me, but I'm not claiming anything special. I'm saying there are public events there. They are open to interpretation, as they were at the time, and the issue really is what is the best explanation of those, and I think 
that is a legitimate debate. I've made it very clear what my conclusion is. I've made it clear it is a matter of faith and that I cannot prove this. But I've also suggested that whatever judgment we make on this is actually a matter of faith. And therefore, while I'm very happy to be challenged on this, I think I'm still entitled to say that this seems to me to be the best way of making sense of it and live my life out on its basis. Thank you. Right. What about that? Why don't you go? Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Michael. Good job, buddy. Really? Hold on, hold on, don't leave that. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this uh, has been taped. It's been videotaped. There will be a DVD. Uh, there will be, uh, there will be, uh, it'll be up on the internet site of the Ethics and Public Policy Center, we think, by sometime next week. So we encourage you to go to that site, and if you want to watch it again or tell your friends about it, feel free. Uh, again, I want to underline, I think we ought to do this again. Sure thing. Yes, sir. Thank you.